For quite a while now, since I have been talking about the bad IDs in the game for so long, like, oh my god, I have an actual problem so long, I wanted to finally talk about the best of the best IDs, in a similar fashion to my now pretty outdated video talking about the worst of the worst IDs. But the script for that video ended up being not that good, so I scrapped it and waited for something to click for that video to work. And it came not three days later when St. Clair was fully released. Now that might sound strange. After all, St. Sinclair, while certainly a good ID, is not overpowered, right? Well, that's just the thing. St. Sinclair is not overpowered, and the question then ends up being, how is he not overpowered? Now, that kind of sounds like a joke, but I am being serious. This is an actual question that I think has an actual answer. So in this video, I'll be going through Sank Sinclair's kit and talking about why, despite being insanely good on the surface and even below the surface, he's actually balanced out in a pretty unique way, and also how that balance affects and applies to all other Sinclair IDs with a particular focus on one very peculiar Sinclair ID. So looking at Sank Sinclair's skills and numbers, with his conditionals active, they are well above average. With none of his skills rolling poorly, even without the conditions active, hell, none of his skills roll even average when he has half his conditions fulfilled. An 11 rolling skill 1 is actually something that used to be specifically reserved for 2 star IDs, but now it has crept its way into the 3 star rarity, with both Sank Sinclair and Harpooner Heathcliff having a free 11 roll. However, St. Clair goes that one step further and gets a 13 roll just for being a little bit fast. And being fast is easy enough when your speed range is 4 to 8, you get 2 haste next turn from that skill 1, and you have the entire mechanic of Declared Duel giving you even more haste, which then has further synergy with the skill 2 and 3. Since, unlike the other two Sank IDs, much as I love them, St. Clair has the coin advantage, since you want to hit enemies with Declared Duel as much as possible for more haste. I think it's relatively fair to say that St. Clair's skill 2 at up tie 4, which by the way this guy is an easy S tier up tie 4 value, but it's easy to call this a 19 rolling skill 2. Most enemies in this game have an average max speed roll of around 5, at least from my baseline observations, so St. Sinclair, not even max rolling speed, can still get plus 1 of his potentially plus 2 coin power conditions, and if a skill 1 was used the previous turn, or any skill was used the previous turn when declared a duel is up, then the plus two coin power is practically a sure thing. Now, I should not have to explain why a 22 rolling skill 2 with relative consistency that can proc on turn 1 and can proc every turn is extremely strong. W. Ryoshu was and still is infamous for a 23 rolling skill 2 with 15 plus charge, which is, and I can't believe I'm saying this, genuinely a harder condition than being faster than the opponent 9 out of 10 times. While I could honestly go on about the skill 2, the skill 3 is where things can get even more ridiculous. Single combat is actually a very easy condition to fulfill. Since it only requires you to have Sinclair be the only ID targeting that one skill slot, and not body part. This is a very important distinction that ends up not being very good in human fights since single combat is either not fulfilled or Sinclair is the only one attacking the enemy, but it basically gives a free to fragile in focused encounters so long as you are not actively throwing by doing something like this. And he's extremely fast to boot, so you can relatively reliably have your entire team deal plus 20% more damage. And you can stack this with other fragility modifiers to create a nuke turn of massive proportions that just wasn't possible before his release. Now, while the skill 3 is certainly not the strongest numbers wise, and being 6 speed higher than the opponent is where things start to get a little bit difficult, it's still feasible. And team synergy via Crow's Eye View, or just using any amount of bind, since it's about the difference of speed between you and the opponent, not just your speed, which is actually better for him, because he can roll a 3 on speed and still get one of his coin power conditions, but I digress, but it can mean you have a 26 rolling skill 3, giving 2 fragile, inflicting declared duel, which makes the rest of his kit that much better, and the potential for plus 50% crit damage on the last coin, though that is a bit inconsistent due to the amount of poise count required. Now believe it or not, even though I have already said over 500 words praising Saint Sinclair and saying how good he is, I am still not done. Since with his passive, alongside going faster based on poise count, which 
By the way, this makes him another prime target for BL Yisang's support passive. He is almost always just dealing 10% more damage. Which is just another small damage boost, but it will also be relevant later, so keep it in mind. So, looking at Sang Sinclair at max potential. He rolls a 13, 22, and 26, which by the way is insane. He deals 10% more damage on all of these skills, meaning he has zero bad skills due to a 13 being well above average for a 2 coin skill 1, and the rest kind of speak for themselves. And he gains 3 to 4 haste every turn, assuming to declare duels on the opponent he is hitting. And he inflicts 2 fragile with every skill 3. So then, looking at these numbers and every other related factor, and also kind of ignoring the fact that he perfectly fuels Lantern, which is a very good sustain ego, how is Sank Sinclair not being lauded as the next overpowered ID? Well, if you know anything about this game, you probably already know why this is not the case. And the reason for why starts with a 1, and ends with a Who Shall Grip Sinclair. Colloquially known as N. Clair. The poster child of an overpowered ID, and the main reason this video is called what it is. But in case you don't know what that term, opportunity cost, means, one, you are likely far too young to be playing Limbus Company since you have not taken a basic economics class, and two, it means the lost potential of choosing one option over another. This concept aligns very nicely with Limbus, and it's why I use the term so often, since it's so relevant. Like it or not, you can only bring one ID of each sinner into battle. At least until Project Moon releases a mode where you can only use one sinner but all of their IDs. Oh my god, please Project Moon do a mode like this would be so fun. I know it would make no sense lore-wise, but come on. Either way, every time you choose one ID over another, you are unknowingly, or I guess knowingly, calculating the opportunity cost in your head. For example, choosing Warp Ryoshu over Chef Ryoshu runs the massive opportunity cost of your dignity, but also the healing that Chef Ryoshu provides, and a slightly more consistent skill 1 and 2, since these are all benefits you would not have when picking Warp Ryoshu. The same applies the opposite way, since choosing Chef over Warp means you are going to deal less damage overall, as well as a myriad of other smaller opportunity costs which are generally team building related. Getting back to what's relevant though, we are talking about Sinclair, and specifically Enclair, since there was practically no opportunity cost before Sank Sinclair came along. While the ideal way to balance a game like Limbus, in my opinion, is to give different IDs different niches, and make those niches stronger than others in certain scenarios, I don't think it's controversial to say the best niche is damage, and Enclair is pretty much the king of damage. So any potential the other Sinclair IDs had, was kind of squandered by N. Claire. N. Claire was the only Sinclair ID that really existed due to his insane raw damage and actually no, that's uh, that's about it. So every other Sinclair ID ran the heavy cost of not being N. Claire. And while that still exists, yes, and it's partially due to the fact that a lot of Sinclair IDs just straight up suck ass, Sank Sinclair is now part of the conversation. Now, the primary issue stems from the fact that Sank Sinclair and Enclair occupy that same niche. Damage. Sank Sinclair has no utility, and is actually reliant on conditionals, whereas Enclair has no conditional besides his sanity, but that does lead to him being slightly more inconsistent. In a more direct comparison, Sank Sinclair has the better skill 1 in terms of damage and clashing by a good amount, but then Enclair beats out Sank Sinclair in terms of skill 2 and skill 3 damage. However, St. Clair clashes better on the skill 1 and 2, and is only beaten out on the skill 3, since a 30 is pretty much unbeatable. But of course, this is assuming N. Clair is hitting all tails, and that is really what it comes down to. N. Clair can never be as consistent in his damage as St. Sinclair. While yes, his skill 2 can roll a 64 in raw damage, if you hit heads on your first coin, you are actually dealing the same amount of damage as Sank Sinclair, with a raw damage of 48. And you can never be at 45% chance, unless you are going to corrode, which is not very good. Now, some may point to Enclair's higher offense level, leading to him dealing more damage. But if we use the formula of every offense level being 3% more damage, with a 3 offense level difference between the two, the one pierce damage up Sank Clair has actually cancels out this advantage Enclair would otherwise have over him. 
To put it plainly, Sang Sinclair is the better clasher overall, which kind of makes sense, due to 5 sixths of his kit clashing higher than N Clair's skills, and his skill 3 is honestly not too far behind as well. Sang Sinclair is the objective better choice for mirror dungeons, due to how sanity gain works, but N Clair just has higher highs, and will allow you to go faster in quite a lot of content, and while I have gone in depth into how Sang Sinclair can get extra damage, N Clair does have a few things that can boost his damage even more, which puts his ceiling even higher than what I have presented, but we just don't have time to go into that right now. So, what is the point I'm trying to make? Well, this was mostly an excuse to talk about how good Sang Sinclair is, since I worry some may dismiss him simply because John's self-destructive purge over here exists. But also to point out PM's clear step in what I consider the best direction they can take when it comes to dealing with sinners that have such dominant IDs. Rabbit Heathcliff and Harpooner Heathcliff is another good example of this, where now that there are two strong Heathcliff IDs, it feels a little more balanced. And I will always prefer two great options to choose from, rather than just one. And I know this will come in time eventually for all sinners, but it's good to see a start of it. Though of course, as I've said, Sinclair really did have it the worst. And now, St. Clair makes it so you have two and a half strong Sinclair IDs with an actual debate on which of these two to run. And the best part is, I don't have an exact concrete answer to which one of these two IDs is straight up better. They differ in some very relevant ways, and while they are both IDs that just do good raw damage, their damage types are different, and their method of dealing big damage is also kind of different. If you had to ask me, I would say N. Clair still has the edge, but N. Clair used to be seen as this untouchable god of an ID, and it's being proven that we can see IDs that can contest that. And even in Mirror Dungeon, N. Clair is not very good, so there, St. Clair just straight up wins. Now, don't get me wrong. The mere existence of overpowered IDs like Rabbit Heathcliff and N. Clair do have negative effects, like how the IDs those sinners get need to be very strong in order to justify the opportunity cost, and in my opinion, that's a pretty big issue, since it leaves the other IDs that are not overpowered behind. But ultimately, the term overpowered is completely subjective. I choose to look at it as something that is so strong it is the best thing to use in over 90% of scenarios, and by that definition, I don't actually think much in Limbus is overpowered, since again, while damage is the best niche, team compositions do exist, and do well enough, with Seven Heathcliff as the best example of an ID doing well despite the opportunity cost. So while people can argue back and forth on whether Rabbit Heathcliff or N. Clair have broken the game, and I plan to talk about that in a separate video one day, I am glad Project Moon is taking what I consider to be a good direction in terms of offering alternatives that are not objective upgrades, since that would lead to the same problem, but again, but these still have clear potential to be used over the once completely dominant IDs. The only other way to handle IDs like Rabbit or N. Clair would probably just be to nerf them, which I strongly disagree with. So hey, if nothing else, I prefer the power creep of Sinner's overall strength than nerfing individual IDs to keep them in line, because that's just not fun. Really though, there's only one opportunity cost that matters most of all, and that's the drip, and in that case, Sang Sinclair wins by a landslide, case closed. Oh, but there is one last thing that actually has no opportunity cost, and that's subscribing to Esku. I mean, if you made it all this way to the end of the video, thank you for watching, uh, subscribe. I don't shill enough, I would probably have way more subscribers if I did shill, but hey, that's all from me. Thank you for watching. As always, this video ends now.